And welcome. I am Allison Rice, and I am speaking today on behalf of uh, the group of uh, Literatures of Annihilation, Exile and Resistance. Uh, and uh, I am very fortunate to have the opportunity to introduce uh, uh, our speakers for today's event. Uh, this is titled Leaving Childhood Behind, a conversation with Mossab Abu Toha, poet and founder of the Edward Said Public Library in Gaza. Uh, I would like to uh, thank all of those who have participated in uh, planning this particular event. Uh, there are many names uh, to mention, um, but I would like to especially underscore that this event is co-sponsored and co-organized with Archives of the Disappeared Research Seminar, University of Cambridge, and the Religion, Conflict, and Peace Initiative at Harvard University. Um, we are grateful to both of those entities uh, uh, for making this possible. Uh, first, I would like to say a few words of introduction uh, for Mosab Abu Toha, who is a Palestinian bi bilingual poet, essayist, and short story writer from Gaza. And he is joining us today from Gaza. And uh, welcome, Mossab. Thank you for being with us. A graduate in English language, he taught English at the UNRWA schools in Gaza from 2016 to 2019, and is the founder of the Edward Said Public Library, Gaza's first English language library, now has two branches. Uh, so very, very impressive. In 2019 to 2020, Mossab became a visiting poet at Harvard University, hosted by the Department of Comparative Literature. He is also a columnist for Aerosmith Press. Mossab's poetry, essays, and short stories have been or will be published by Poetry, Solstice, Banibal, Periphery, Harvard Human Rights Review, Kika, and Middle East Eye. In 2020, Mossab gave talks and poetry readings at the University of Pennsylvania, Temple University, and the University of Arizona, as well as the American Library Association Midwinter Exhibits and Meetings. Our moderator for today's session with Mossab is Refka Abu Gramale, a professor of modern Arabic literature and film at the Department of Semitic and Arabic Studies at the Freie Universität in Berlin. She is the principal investigator of the European Research Council project titled Pal Read, Country of Words. This is a digital project that explores the history of Palestinian literature. Abu Ramale received her DPhil and MST in modern Arabic literature and film from the University of Oxford and her BA in English literature from the University of British Columbia. Thank you again, all of you, for being present, uh, for attending uh, this conversation. And I'm very happy to turn the floor over to Refka right now. Thank you, Alison, for this introduction. And thank you to the organizers of um, these amazing events, to Azarine and Alyssa, especially. Uh, and to everybody on the board of this um, project. Um, uh, it's such an honor and pleasure to be here with Musab Abu Toha, who's with us from Gaza. Um, I'll just say a few words how uh, we decided to structure this event. So basically, it will be a conversation interspersed with readings and discussion. Uh, Musab will read and share with us um, some of his uh, poems about um, 10 to 13 short poems that he will read to us. I just wanted to highlight, uh, we will we'll touch on this in the discussion, but to highlight that these poems were written in English, so they're not translations. Um, and we will have this conversation for about an hour, and then we will open it up um, for Q&A for the last um, 20 to 30 minutes uh, for your questions. So I think um, we should start with a poem. Musab, I know us literary scholars like to talk and analyze and all of that, but for this uh, time, I would like to get right into the poetry. So if we can hear your first couple of poems and um, based on that, we can start the discussion. 
Okay, thank you, Rifqa, uh, for moderating this uh, conversation. And thanks to the Notre Dame program and all the sponsors for this event. Uh, my first poem that I'm going to read is titled, My Grandfather and Home. My grandfather used to count the days for return with his fingers. He then used stones to count. Not enough. He used the clouds, birds, people. Absence turned out to be too long, 36 years until he died. For us now, it is over 70 years. My grandpa lost his memory. He forgot the numbers, the people, he forgot home. I wish I were with you, grandpa. I would have taught myself to write you poems, volumes of them, and paint our home for you. I would have sewn you from soil a garment decorated with the plants and the trees you had grown. I would have made you perfume from the oranges and soap from the sky's tears of joy. Couldn't think of something purer. I go to the cemetery every day. I look for your grave, but in vain. Are they sure they buried you? Or did you turn into a tree? Or perhaps you flew with a bird to the nowhere. I place your photo in an earthenware pot. I water it every Monday and Thursday at sunset. I was told you used to fast those days. In Ramadan, I water it every day for 30 days or less or more. How big do you want our home to be? I can continue to write poems until you are satisfied. If you wish, I can annex a neighboring planet or two. For this home, I shall not draw boundaries, no punctuation marks. My second poem is titled, My Grandfather Was a Terrorist. My grandfather was a terrorist. He tended to his field, watered the roses in the courtyard, smoked cigarettes with the grandmother, on the yellowish seashore lying like a prayer rug. My grandfather was a terrorist. He picked oranges and lemons, went fishing with brothers until noon, sang a comforting song en route to the farriers with his piebald horse. My grandfather was a terrorist. He made a cup of tea with milk, sat on his verdant land as soft as silk, was incensed at the blinking sun. My grandfather was a terrorist. He departed his house, leaving it for the coming guests, left some water on the table, his vest, lest the guests die of thirst after their conquest. My grandfather was a terrorist. He walked to the nearest safe town, dark as the silent sky, empty as a deserted tent, darkling as a starless night. My grandfather was a terrorist. My grandfather was a man, a breadwinner for 10, whose luxury was to, to have a tent with a blue UN flag set on the rusting pole on the beach next to a cemetery. Thank you very much, Masab, for these poems and uh, what I, uh, I'm calling the grandfather poems, if you don't mind. <laughs> Um, I don't know if you have more grandfather poems in store, but uh, thank you for sharing these two with us, especially uh, to start with these two, because I think they take us right to the very heart, to the very core of your poetry and to Gaza. Um, and before we get into discussing the poems themselves, I thought maybe we can just um, give uh, uh, people who are attending today just a little bit of an idea uh, about you, uh, your poetic beginnings, when did you start to write poetry? And uh, coming back to, to the Gaza point, what, do, what is it like to be a poet, a writer uh, living in Gaza, uh, especially living under siege and Gaza being isolated, marginalized, often overlooked, sadly forgotten, uh, and, and with imminent wars, <laughs> past wars, generational trauma, destruction. Um, what, what does it mean to be a writer living in Gaza? And, and just tell us a little bit about 
how you started to write poetry and, and uh, how you got to, to where you are today. Yeah, I mean, being born in Gaza means being a survivor of mal several atro atrocities, several wars. I lost many friends in Gaza. So, so when I write, I mean, I, I tell people that I still exist. So it is, it is a signal of survival in Gaza to write. To, um, so I, I, I don't know if I was living in maybe in another country, maybe I, I would be a, a football player, maybe I would be a swimmer, I would be uh, maybe a designer of something. But I found myself living in Gaza and I had no means of leaving it I, uh, until 2019. So, I mean, I started to write in 2014. Uh, I graduated with a bachelor's degree in, in English from the Islamic University of Gaza. And in that war, I lost two friends and my, our house was partially destroyed. And I lost some of my books uh, due, to, due to the shrapnel and the debris and the rubble, all of, the, all of those things. And most of the people on my Facebook account with whom I kept in touch were speaking English. So I, I found myself writing about my experiences. And to be honest, uh, maybe at the beginning, I didn't know that I was writing poetry. I mean, people started to comment, oh, what a, what a beautiful poem. So I mean, I, I found some people ready to, to, to listen to me and hear my voice. So I thought, I thought that I should keep doing so. And I, I think with uh, the more I kept in touch with people, the more I kept uh, writing, the more I found myself. So writing poetry in Gaza is something, is something that maybe is a privilege because at least I can document what I, I experienced as a human being. And I feel, I feel uh, sad for those who lost their lives without, without telling us about their dreams, about the hardships they went through. So I think writing <clears throat> is a hard thing to do, but at, but at the same time, it is uh, a luxury. And let's come back to your grandfather. Why, why are you focused on this figure, the grandfather figure? I mean, the, the grandfather figure in these poems seems to capture a lot of the themes that um, uh, are the essence of this kind of Palestinian experience of being a refugee, living in refugee camps, the separations, the death, um, the, the kind of pining for return, uh, but also memory and forgetting. Uh, and of course, there's one aspect in this in the second poem is is defying stereotypes. You're, it's there's a kind of humor in that play that you do with my father. Uh, my grandfather was a terrorist, and then you tell us the most beautiful things <laughs> about your grandfather. So, tell us more about this grandfather figure in your poetry. So, my grandfather unfortunately passed away before before my father uh, got married. So I never met my grandfather in my life. And I, I tend to think that my grandfather to me is something like Yaffa. It's like the Palestine that I never stepped my foot on, my, my, my original hometown before Israel was created in 1948. So when, when I talk about my grandfather or about the beautiful things that he used to do or the things that I, I beg my father to tell me about him, I'm just trying to, to create something I never saw before. So when I talk about my grandfather, I'm talking about the paradise that we lost. Uh, to me as a person who likes to hear stories, I, I tend, so, so last two years ago, I went to Jordan for my visa interview and I met my, my aunt who is now in her seventies for the first time in my life and who is, who, who, who is married to the cousin of my grandfather. So from the beginning, I started to ask them, please describe my grandfather to me because, because he was a friend of my grandfather. So, so I was asking him not about my grandfather as a buddy, no, about my grandfather as the landscape of Palestine, what he used to do, the kind of fish he used to eat, if he liked Um Kulthum or Fairuz as singers, uh, his his day schedule. I want to learn about the Palestine I never, I never experienced. 
But unfortunately, I'm trying to uh, to tell the story of my grandfather based on the on some anecdotes that my father tells me or some of the people who who uh, happened to meet to meet my grandfather when he was young before. And, and another thing about my grandfather, my grandfather was very strong. I mean, physically, he was healthy. And all of a sudden, in the 1980s, uh, he got sick and just four years and he died. So he represents Palestine to me. Palestine was full of beauty, full of strength, full of life. And then all of a sudden, the occupation, the expulsion of thousands of Palestinians, the destruction of 400 villages, and you know the, the exile that many Palestinians had to, to float on, into. So I think one last question about um, the grandfather poems is, I, and people um, can't see this at the moment, but because I have the poem in front of me, the first poem you read, My Grandfather and Home, is all in small caps. Um, and I, I was wondering, because the other one uh, is in the regular way we write, of course, so why did you decide to write this poem physically on, let's say, paper in this particular way? So it looks different than the other poem. Yeah. So, so uh, because I cannot, I cannot create my homeland in reality, I promised my grandfather to create a homeland for him and for me, a home, in words. So these words are all in the small case, no capital letter, even for the I. There are no punctuation marks because the punctuation marks in, the, in a sentence are something like a police officer that tells the sentence, okay, you stop here. Then, no, no, I didn't want to, create, to put anything in this poem because this poem is the home that I'm creating for my grandfather. And, and even if, if my grandfather wish, uh, would wish, I would, continue to write poems and even maybe lengthen this poem, which is about a, a page and a half, I would continue writing it and expanding it until I could annex a neighboring planet. Or maybe I would, you know, <laughs> all the solar system planets I would include in this home. So this is why there are no punctuation marks. There, are, there is no capital letter in the poem because these things limit the, the home that I'm trying to create for my grandfather. Thank you, Musab. So let's move on to the uh, next poem, please. Yeah, the next poem is, <clears throat> is titled A Litany for One Land After Audley Lord. And this, uh, I put this poem in order uh, just after the, po the poems about my grandfather because they still talk about uh, Palestine that we lost. A Litany for One Land. For those living on the other side, we can see you. We can see the rain when it powers on your, on your, our fields, on your, our valleys, and when it slides on the roofs of your modern houses, built atop our homes. Can you take off your glasses and look at us here? See how the rain has flooded our streets, how the school children's umbrellas have been pierced by the brickly rain, the trees you see have been watered with our tears. They bear no fruit. The red roses take their color from our blood. They smell of death. The river that separates us from, from you is just a mirage you created when you expelled us. It is one land. For those who are standing on the other side, shooting at us, spitting on us, how long will you be able to stand fenced by hate? Are you going to keep your black glasses on until you are unable to put them down? Soon, you won't, we won't be here for you to watch. It won't matter if you blinker your eyes or not, if you can stand or not. You won't cross that river to take more lands because you will vanish into your mirage. You can't build a new colony on our graves. And when we die, our, bo our bones will continue to grow, to reach and intertwine with the roots of our olive and orange trees, to bathe in the sweet Yaffa Sea. One day, 
we will be born again when you are not there. Because this land knows us. She is our mother. When we die, we are just resting in her womb until the darkness is cleared. For those who are not here anymore, we have been here forever. We have been speaking to you, but you never cared to listen. Thank you, Musab. Um, I think uh, maybe there's two parts to the questions I want to ask. One is more general, but and one is more specific to this poem. And uh, I'll start with the more specific and this kind of um, image that you create in this poem of a land that um, simultaneously has ruins and layers and uh, and this kind of layering process that keeps happening over and over again, but primarily you are addressing an other, so the other is being addressed. And maybe you can say something about this, about this addressee, this, uh, this other that you are talking to and ab about this kind of layering process that simultaneously these two things are supposed to exist in this one land and, and how this is tackled in the poem. Yeah. So this is, this is a good question about the other because the other is just a big term. So what I, what I mean about the other is those who look at us as, as different, as less than them. So, I mean, it doesn't matter whether those others are from this, 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 this religion or this race or whatever it is. Because at the end, I think that we all humans, we are from the same, the same source. And when we die, we just, we just become the same thing. I mean, our, our biology, our, uh, the components of our bodies are just similar. But I mean, when I talk about the others, those others who, who, who reject to see us as similar to them. So I'm just calling to them because one day they will be unable to see us because they kept their black glasses. And I, I, try, I tend to think that, that if we put any person in a room, in a dark room, where no, there is no sun, there is no light. If you put them in a room, I think their ability to see maybe after a year or two years will be less than before. And this is, this is what happens when people reject the others, reject to listen to them, and all of a sudden there is a trouble. Why, why there is a trouble? Because you never listen to these people who, who, who continue to crying and telling, them, telling you that they are bleeding until you might drown in the pool of blood from those people who have been bleeding for hundreds of years. So those others, they are, the, they are just like us, but they don't want to see us like as, as people. And uh, one more aspect that runs through this poem, but also the grandfather poems, is this um, notion of being exiled in your own homeland. And I know we discussed it when we spoke uh, before, but uh, I would love to hear more of your thoughts on this kind of experience or feeling uh, of being exiled in, exiled in your own homeland, in your own land, and how this translates into your poetry. Yeah, I mean, the, the exile within, I mean, has two, two, me, two, two levels. We are exiled in, inside because, because of, unfortunately, and because of the, 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 the political rift between the two main uh, factions in Palestine. So, I mean, people are trying to, to live a normal life. There is, there is the Israeli occupation, but unfortunately, there is the political rift between Hamas and Fatah. But there is... Uh, there is a geographical separation, not, also, not only political, between the West Bank and Gaza. So most of the people here in Gaza, I mean, they stop thinking about returning to their homeland, to Yaffa or Acre or etc. I mean, they, they are just trying to think, do we really belong here? Why are these people, even though they are Palestinian, why are they fighting with each other for a government, for the legislation council, etc.? I mean, so they, they feel exiled even they don't, so when I mean exile, I mean, they don't feel that they belong where they happen to be born. So this, this feeling of, of exile, I mean, is, is really common here in Gaza. 
because Gaza has been under siege for seven, for for 14 years at least, and and many people are trying to leave Gaza. So, I mean, as long as people are are thinking of leaving their country, then they are exiled until they leave to another exile. Thank you, Musab. Um, I think let's move on to the next poem and I'll ask my more general questions after that. Okay. The, <clears throat> the, the, the next poem is titled Forever Homeless. And I wrote it uh, after my experience in leaving Gaza and being searched several times, not, not necessarily at the airports, but also on my way from Gaza to Cairo. I mean, it's it's just very humiliating, and and also being because I'm from Gaza, I might have in my suitcases some bombs, nuclear bombs, <clears throat> or some destructive uh, weapons. So you know, so the title is "Forever Homeless." Before my long travel, I pack my suitcases, stuff them with some sand from our land some scent from my mother's kitchen and sounds of birds in the morning. And in my pockets, I put the four directions. My hands are the compass. At the airport, I beg the officer not to open the suitcases and if needed to touch my clothes gently. Otherwise, I would be standing on nothing, surrounded by nothing, see nothing. I would be weightless and forever homeless. Yes, so this poem extends on this idea of exile, but takes it not just exile in the homeland, exile everywhere so that you become weightless and homeless. And, and the, I like this combination of weightlessness and homelessness, that the way that you combine this in the poem. Um, I don't know if you want to say more about this uh, homelessness uh, in relation to exile, but not just exile in relation to this particular situation of Gaza or, or of being uh, or being born in Gaza, at least. Yeah, well, I, I mean, in fact, when we talk about Gaza, maybe unlike the, the West Bank, the other half of the Palestinian territories, <clears throat> we talk about people being unable to leave Gaza freely and also being unable to return to it when they want. So it's not only, so when we talk about a prison, it's a prison for the privileged. So if you, if you in order to enter Gaza, you need to have your Palestinian ID there and, and in it, you, there should be Gaza in it. So you are not, not, I mean, Gazans are privileged because they are the only people in the world who can enter this, <laughs> this uh, geographical uh, spot on this earth. And also, no one can easily leave Gaza without a very necessary uh, reason. Let's say a medical situation, or maybe a visa to uh, to to find life uh, on Jupiter. So you are the only person uh, who can do this. Then maybe if you are from Gaza, then they can give you the visa and the permit to leave. Um, so when I talk about Gaza people also are not able to protect what they value because the Israelis would uh, many times would destroy a house on the heads of the, its inhabitants. And when I, when I talk about myself being homeless, although I have a home in Gaza, but I cannot carry with me from this home what I want when I leave, something that would remind me of my home in Gaza. I cannot carry lots of things. For example, when I when I left, left Gaza uh, for the first time in 2019, I didn't take my 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 drafts, my poem put poems and drafts with me uh, to Jordan or to Egypt or to America because I was scared that maybe an officer would look read it, read them and say, uh, "Did you write this? Uh, what's this word? Do you hate Israel? Uh, do you hate Egypt? Do you hate the uh, reg this regime or that regime?" Etc. Uh, is this your language? Okay, we like it, but uh, this is not uh, how you should use it. So, so when a Palestinian travels, it means that he might not be able to return. So he 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 tries his best to stuff his suitcase with with whatever 
he would like to keep for the rest of his life, as if he's going to the grave. And <laughs> there is a popular question, if you are going to die tomorrow, what would you like to take with you to the grave? So to, for a Gazan, I mentioned something. I, I mentioned some sand from our land, some sand from my mother's kitchen, and some sounds of birds in the morning. So these are things that we value. These are normal things, maybe to people in the world, but not for people in Gaza. Thank you, Musab. Actually, this really um, takes us into the next poem. So why don't you read the next poem and we'll continue the, the conversation. Yeah, the next poem is titled Leaving a Childhood Behind, which is the title of this event. And just before I get to read it, um, I, I wrote it thinking of both Mahmoud Darwish, the Palestine giant poet, uh, the Palestinian giant poet, and me as a, as a young poet. Um, so Mahmoud Darwish had to uh, vacate their house when he was six in 1948. So he was born in 1941. So he had to evacuate, to, to leave his house because of the Israeli uh, or the Zionist uh, gangs. Uh, so they left their house when he was seven. And uh, for me in 2008, I left my house because of the Israeli bombardment in my area. I was uh, 15 or 16 at the time. So when I left, I, I, I didn't only leave my clothes or didn't leave my storybook or, no, I, I, I left my childhood, all of it. Because when I left my home, I grew up very quickly. I was no longer a child. So this is the title of the poem, Leaving Childhood Behind. When I fled, I left my childhood in the drawer and on the kitchen table. I left my toy horse in its plastic bag. I left without looking at the clock. I, forg I forget whether it was noon or evening. Our horse spent the night alone. No water, no grain for dinner. It must have thought we had left to cook a meal for late guests or make a cake for my sister's 10th birthday. I walked with my sister down on the road with no end point. We sang a birthday song. The hovering warplanes echoed across the heavens. My tired parents walked behind, my father clutching to his chest the keys to our house and to the stable. We arrived at a rescue station. The news of ceaseless airstrikes roared on the radio. I hated death, but I hated life too when we had to walk to our prolonged death, reciting our never ending ode. Thank you, Musab. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the Mahmoud Darwish uh, uh, inspiration uh, for this poem and this link between your childhood and his experience of, uh, of leaving his uh, town, El Birwe, which was uh, completely destroyed. So it, it no longer existed, even though he was able to uh, go back, but never back to his own village. Um, so the one, the line that obviously struck me in this, um, in this poem is, our horse spent the night alone. I mean, this is the, the clear reference to Mahmoud Darwish. Uh, and, and you mentioned a toy horse and uh, the, the horse spending the night alone. So maybe you can just tell us about this horse figure, the Mahmoud Darwish link. What does this capture? This, I mean, this is the title of one of the poetry collections of Mahmoud Darwish and uh, a poem, um, but it's such a significant image. And of course the horse comes up in Palestinian literature and film as well uh, quite often. So I just wanted to hear from you what this meant to you to make this link with Mahmoud Darwish and the horse and your childhood in this poem. I really, I really like the question and that you brought this point and the conversation. Um, I mentioned the horse in the poem. Uh, it's, maybe it's the same horse. Maybe this, the horse that Mahmoud Darwish talked about uh, is still alive and I brought it in my poem. But Mahmoud Darwish's horse, as he mentioned in his poem, he asked my, Mahmoud Darwish, the, the person in his poem, asked his father, uh, uh, his, his father responded, why did you leave the horse alone? His father respond, uh, responded with say, by saying, um, um, to watch over the fields. 
So this, is, this was a good answer uh, to a child. But in my case, the horse I'm talking about in Gaza is not there uh, to, to look after uh, a field or, uh, or a land. No, the horse was left there with no water, no grain for dinner. And the horse even thought that the, the family left to cook a meal for late guests. So, I mean, the horse, <laughs> I mean, didn't know that, that the family had to leave um, and, and may, maybe make a cake for my sister's 10th birthday. Maybe the, the horse thought that the fire, that the, the sound of explosions or, uh, or, or it was the sound of some airstrikes. <laughs> so it was maybe a, a, a birthday for my sister. So it's truly the same, maybe the same horse, I don't know, but my situation in Gaza differs from Mahmoud Darwish because he was born in a village. And in the village, there are, there are open fields, there are horses, etc. But here in Gaza, you would come back to your home after maybe two weeks of, of departure because you could uh, not return home because of the Israeli bombardment. And you might found your, find your horse killed by a bomb, just like the, the uh, several uh, cows that I happened to, to watch uh, being killed and pierced by shrapnel in Chujaia in, uh, in East Gaza in 2014. I mean, a whole barn, a whole farm where cows used to be milked and where, 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 where cows used to, uh, to sing to the birds around them. When people returned homes after a ceasefire, they found hundreds of cows being killed by the Israeli uh, blind shells. Um, thank you, Musab. On this note, since you men mentioned uh, shrapnel and this kind of violence and, and um, death, not just to humans, animals, uh, life on earth, uh, that uh, is as a result of these bombardments and use of um, illegal chemical weapons and, and other sorts of uh, things that have been dumped onto Gaza, unfortunately, uh, which has affected all life on earth in Gaza. Uh, maybe we can move on to your next two poems, which are on about this. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to read two poems, two short poems. Um, and I wrote them during the Israeli May attack on Gaza, uh, which uh, lasted for 12 days and took the lives of hundreds of people. And I wrote this poem, Shrapnel, Looking for Laughter, about the Attanani family. Uh, Attanani family were, were, were killed under the rubble of their neighbor's house because they had to run away from their house because of the Israeli bombardment. So in the, on their way out of their house, the, their neighbor's house was this bombed and the house fell on them. Um, so the father and the mother and their four children were killed. So a whole family just was wiped out. So I wrote a poem titled Shrapnel Looking for Laughter. The house bombed now, everyone dead. The kids, the parents, the toys, actors on TV, characters in novels, personas in poetry collections, the I, the he, the he, and she, no pronouns is left in the plays, not even for surviving kids when they learn part of speech, parts of speech next year. Shrapnel flies in the dark, looks for the family's peals of laughter, hiding behind piles of disfigured walls and bleeding picture frames. The radio no longer speaks. Its batteries have burned, the antenna broke. Even the broadcaster felt the pain when the radio was hit. Even we, hearing the bomb as it fell, took to the ground, everyone counting the others around them. We were safe, but our hearts still ache. And the second poem story is not titled, so it's untitled. A father wakes up at night, sees the random colors on the walls drawn by his four-year-old son, but he's dead after an airstrike. The colors are about four feet high. 
Next year, there would be five or six, but the painter's dead and the museum has no new paintings to show. Thank you, Musab. I think I will come back to my general question because it, uh, it um, links to what you said about documenting life in Gaza, but also documenting what happens in Gaza. And here I, I want to ask you about uh, writing poetry in English and you are bilingual, so you do write in both languages, Arabic and English. You mentioned that there was a time when you wanted to tell friends what was going on and that's how you started writing. But he, here I want to ask you, to tell us more about being a bilingual poet. What does it mean to you to write in Arabic? What does it mean to, for you to write in English? And also how has the reception been by the different audiences, especially poems like this, uh, these poems that give us um, a kind of dark insight into what, what happens in Gaza in these um, moments of extreme trauma. Uh, so maybe you can just say something about writing in two languages and, and how the audiences uh, receive your work. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure if it's a bliss to be able to write in two languages because sometimes I struggle to decide. I mean, for example, an idea comes to my mind, an image, I mean, a spark for a new poem. And sometimes I struggle whether I should write it in Arabic or in English, I mean, I mean, once I tried to write a, a poem about mirror, titled Mirror, I wrote it in English. And then I, 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 want, I decided to write a poem about mirror in Arabic and they were completely different. So I mean, so, I mean you might have the same title, but the poem is really, really different. Um, usually, as I mentioned, when I write in English, I most of the time, think of an English speaking audience because English is the language of, of, empire, of, of colonization, the language of Britain, which uh, promised uh, Palestine to the Jews of the world. It's the language of America, which supports Israel uh, with no questions. And I hope it changes. Uh, it's the language of of the world, the language of science and technology. So when I write in English, I mean, it's not, it's not a choice. I, sometimes I don't decide that I, I want to write in English. No, this is a necessity. This is a duty. This is something that I need to tell people about. I mean, I'm not a reporter. I'm not a journalist, uh, but I'm a poet who tries to not only tell people about what happened to me. No, so there are other two things to this point. I, I might write about what might have happened to me hadn't I left the place I was in when, the, when a bombing, let's say, uh, uh, took place. So this is one thing. So for example, I survived death uh, in 2009 and I wrote a, a very long poem about it. Uh, a shrapnel uh, pierced just very close to my neck and I was, I was going to die. So, so writing, writing a poem about what might have happened if the, if the poem pierced my windpipe, what, what's going to happen after that? I mean, would I have been able to write all these things that I'm now talking to you? Would I have married my wife and have, have two, three children? So this is one thing. And the other thing is writing about other families, other children who, unfortunately, do not have the language or they do not have the capacity to write about their lives. So for example, I just read the poem about a Tanani family, Shrabna looking for laughter. So those people, the six, the, the six people in the Tanani family who were killed, I mean, we never heard what happened to them because they were killed. Who, who is going to speak for them? So they had stories. There were some. There, there was a TV in their house, and there they, they might they, they might have. I mean, they might have been watching uh, Tom and Jerry or a cartoon on NBC Three or 
on National Geographic and they were talking about animals or this or that. And they wanted to visit a zoo in America when, when they grow up and when there is an airport, when, when there is an airport in Gaza. So who, who, who could write about all these things? So I think it's, it's, my, it's my duty, it's my homework as a poet, not only to write about my homework. No, I should write about these people because these people are not only numbers. So on TV, you hear, okay, six people were killed in a car accident. Six people were killed after an Israeli strike. But these are just not numbers because the numbers just go away and then a new number. Uh, 11 people were uh, wounded after this or that. But I don't want these people to, to cross in front of us on, on TV just as numbers. No, they are people. They are, they had their dreams. I know this is a cliche. This is, I'm, I don't want to say what other people say, but these people didn't have the time, if I would say, didn't have the time or the opportunity to tell us what they experienced before they died. So I want to imagine what, what happened to them. And I also, what makes, what, what drives me to write about them is that it might have been me or my kids. I mean, I, I survived death, not because I'm, I, I'm, I'm smart. No, I mean, it was luck. Yeah, thank you, Musab. So I think let's move on to a slightly different uh, orientation of a set of poems. Um, I would suggest, if you don't mind, uh, Musab, to read the next three poems, uh, just because I'm conscious of time and I, I want to prioritize your poetry, unless you uh, want to skip yeah. something. Yeah, yeah. I just want to read uh, uh, two, two poems, only two poems. So the, poem, okay, uh, the, the first poem is Desert and Exile. Mm -hmm. And the last poem is Things You May Find Hidden in My Ear because it is the title of my forthcoming poetry collection uh, this coming year. The first poem is Desert and Exile for Men in the Sun. So Men in the Sun is the title of a novella uh, written by Hassan Kanafani, a Palestinian novelist and and uh, activist who was uh, assassinated in Beirut in the 1970s. <laughs> so desert and exile, which is vaster in the night, the desert or the dark? Which is heavier on the sand, your feet or your fear? Why don't you knock on the walls of the water tank? Is sleep wrapping its thick robe around your mouths? I can hear the wheels sound on the moving sand and the throbbing heart of silence. The driver loses the map and takes you to the earth where you will be buried. But all the prayers and anecdotes you shared will be heard by the mirage of exiled desert and the bones of dead camels and horses whose riders are buried under the erased footpaths. And do you want to ask any question before yeah. I go to the Yes, poem? let's stop here because the, the last poem is, is different than these poems. Yeah. So um, I'll just ask you uh, a few questions about these kind of dedication poems, <laughs> if I can call them that. Uh, so the one you didn't read is actually called To Hassan Kanafani. And the one that you read is, uh, is about uh, or um, maybe inspired by one of Hassan Kanafani's uh, uh, novellas, Men in the Sun, you even dedicate the poem to a literary work, which is quite unique. Um, so you're dedicating this uh, poem to uh, Rassan Kanafani's novella. Um, I just wanted to, uh, th this kind of image of, um, of silence in the midst of the desert uh, and this inability to speak um, and kind of being buried under the erased footpaths, as you put it. I mean, this uh, Rassan Kanafani's novella and this kind of image, which is the end of the novella, also the end of the film, which was based on the novella, is uh, of trying to knock on the um, inside of uh, uh, a truck that is smuggling Palestinian refugees from Iraq to Kuwait. This image has resonated so strongly in just with uh, 
the refugee experiences uh, recently of Syrian refugees who have gone through these um, really um, dangerous smuggling uh, uh, routes and and being conned and being you know uh, and uh, you know experiencing all this kind of fraud and everything that happens with these smuggling experiences and and, and this kind of um, silence that surrounds this experience. So I just wanted to hear from you what what this image means to you. This. Uh, it, uh, trying to knock, not it being able to speak, not being able to let the world know what is happening to you. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I mean, I mean, the word silence is a very important word to me in my life and in my work. We all know that, I mean, the saying silence is a sign of consent. But what if we are unable to talk? What if we are if our, our tongues are, are cut? What if our lips are soon? I mean, I mean they, these people uh, who were in the water truck being smug smuggled from Iraq to Kuwait, these Palestinian uh, workmen, I mean, they were tired. They were, they were, they were suffocated. They, they were hungry. And they represent all of those Palestinians and still today who are unable to find work who are unable to, 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 to build a house of their own, who are still unable to decide whether they should remain where they are or if they should leave, like the many hundreds of young Palestinians in Gaza, my age, leaving to Turkey, some people trying to cross from Turkey to Europe, to Belgium or Serbia or whatever country is close to Turkey. And many people of them, they did not die in the water tank. They died in the jungle, in the woods between those countries, either of cold, because they did not, ha they did not have enough clothes, either of hunger, they, did not, they, ran, they ran out of food, or even from, uh, I mean, uh, animals or from scorpions. I mean, a person, a young, a young man who is a pharmacist, who, is, who lives uh, near, close to us, uh, I mean, he tried to open his business, a pharmacy here, but it, it didn't work. So he, he couldn't earn money to, to put food on the table for his family. So he had to, to, to leave to, 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 to Turkey. And from Turkey, he spent some time there. And then he tried to smuggle, to, uh, to smuggle himself along with some other people to, I, I forgot, I think Ukraine or uh, and I forgot the, the name of the country, but he died on the way there. Do you imagine someone who has a pharmacy degree having to leave Gaza and look for, uh, for look, look, look for a country to seek asylum there because of the situation? So, I mean, having to leave Gaza is not only about being uh, harmed by the Israeli airstrikes, but it's also about not, be, not finding yourself. You have a degree, you are... Uh, you spend five or six or seven years learning and earning a degree, and then you just sit at your home with nothing to do. So this is what, what people are trying to do here in Gaza. Just the same, the same reason why those men and the son had to, to leave Iraq, Iraq to, to Kuwait. Um, so a final question um, before turning to the last poem, and this is about, I mean, you have a number of poems which are dedicated to important Palestinian figures. Uh, we, we saw the references to Mahmoud Darwish, but you also have a poem dedicated to Mahmoud Darwish. You have these poems uh, in relation to Ghassan Kanafani. Uh, Ibrahim Abu Lughod also comes up in your poems. Edward Said. Um, and so I wanted to ask you to say a little bit about what these people represent to you. Why are you dedicating your poems to them? Of course, in particular, Mahmoud Darwish, but we talked about it uh, before. I mean, Mahmoud Dar Darwish casts a big shadow on Palestinian literature and Palestinian poetry. So your relationship to him might be different, but I'm interested to hear why you dedicated poems to Edward Said, Ibrahim Abu Lughod, Ghassan Kanafani, what they mean to you. I mean, the names that I picked are not, uh, are not unique to me. I mean, I'm not the only person who was influenced by them. 
Uh, I want to focus here on Ibrahim Abu Lughod because not many people know about him. So Ibrahim Abu Lughod is uh, a political scientist who was uh, who was he who who comes originally from Yaffa, the same city my grandfather was expelled from. So uh, when I was in Arizona visiting a, a friend, he told me about Ibrahim Abu Lughod and his brother uh, visiting uh, their home, what used to be their home in Yaffa, and the two brothers started to talk about. Uh, their memory of the house. So I tried to create this house for them. So so in, in the poem, if, if you don't mind me reading it, because it's very short. Uh, can I read it? Okay, so Ibrahim Abu Lughod and brother in Yaffa. The two walk towards the beach barefoot. With his soft index finger, Ibrahim starts to draw a map of what used to be their home. No, Ibrahim, the kitchen is a little farther to the north. Oh, don't step over there. Dad was sleeping there on the couch. Tourist kids run by, flying kites. The waves hit the beach, shaded with cloud cover. The mosque on the hilltop calls for prayer. Ibrahim and his brother still argue where their kitchen was. They both sit on the sand. Ibrahim takes out a lighter, wishes he could make tea in their kitchen for all on the beach. Ibrahim look upward to what used to be their kitchen window. The mint no longer grows. So I'm just trying to, to create a home for Ibrahim Abu Lughod, uh, who was a very close friend of uh, Edward Said, and he has a very uh, great influence on Edward Said himself. Uh, so uh, I admire Ibrahim Abu Lughod for uh, a very important uh, thing that he did, which was um, he was a, polit a political science professor in, uh, I think, Northwestern University. And, <clears throat> and he insisted on, on returning to Palestine, even though he had a post, I mean, he had a place to work in America, but no, he decided and he insisted on returning to Palestine and teaching at Berzet University. He wanted to do something to his country. And he insisted on being buried in Yaffa, the birth of his place, and which, which they did, although it was not easy to do so. So I wanted to dedicate this poem to him uh, because of what he did and because of his uh, wish to be uh, buried in, in, in Yaffa. And the other influence, Edward Said, and I think there are, there are, I mean, tons of things that one can talk about Edward Said. Uh, Edward Said um, is an organic intellectual uh, who, who left the Palestine Liberation Organizations, uh, Palestine, so there, there was a, a body in the Palestine Liberation Organization called the Palestine uh, National Council. He stepped down from this post uh, in a protest to the Oslo Accords. And he was on good relationship with Yasser Arafat, the Palestine uh, to be president at the time, the Palestinian president to be at the time. I mean, he didn't say what other people wanted to hear. No, he, 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 he told others what he believed was right. So he represents a lot of things to me. And Hassan Kalfan, I think we talked about him. He was, he, I mean, he lived only for 36 years, but he wrote a lot of novellas and he had uh, lots of drawings. And he was a spokesperson, a spokesperson for the Palestine PLF, the Palestine Liberation uh, PLF. PFLP. Yeah, the, yeah, one of the movements. So he was a, spe a spokesperson. He was uh, an editor at a newspaper. He was a, no a, novel uh, a novella writer and he was a, a, a painter. So he, he was lots of things in this very short life. And, and he was outspoken of the Israeli occupation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Masab. Of course, um, uh, uh, Hassan Kanafani. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. 
Ghassan Kanafani was a pioneer in a, 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 a in a different way than Ibrahim Abu Lughad. And I just wanted to say thank you for highlighting Ibrahim Abu Lughad. He, he, he's not, I mean, he was very influential for that generation, but our generation forgets about his influence. And uh, since he didn't leave a lot of cultural literary works behind him, I just wanted to say that there is a beautiful volume that was published on him by Birzeit University, because I had been really searching for more on Ibrahim Abu Lughad because I could understand that he had such a great influence, but it was hard to track uh, this kind of influence. But yeah, uh, Birzeit University did publish a, a, a nice volume on Ibrahim Abu Lughad. It might be difficult yeah. to find, but it's there and it's uh, it's about his life and work and, and thought. Yeah. So and maybe, um, maybe you can yeah. add my poem to the to these to these references. <laughs> Yes, absolutely, because I'm really uh, trying to hunt it down for the project, especially that uh, we're trying to get this kind of information. So yeah, we can add it as a reference. <laughs> so Musab, let's move to the last poem. And uh, I think we can stop there after you read the last poem. It's a beautiful, it's, it's, I, I'm happy you chose it as your last poem. It will leave us on uh, a specific note. And I think, Alison, if you're happy with it, we can just open up for Q&A straight after Musab uh, reads the last poem. Uh, and Musab, if you want to say something about the poem before reading it, please go ahead, uh, because I, I think we should just give the audience a chance to ask questions. Okay, thank you. Um, so this poem is very special to me, things you may find hidden in my ear. First, because it's the title of my forthcoming poetry collection. And second, because I wrote it um, just after I had a surgery on my ear uh, in America. So I, I, I tried very hard to, to have the surgery on my ear in Gaza, but because of the, the very critical situation in Gaza, the lack of equipment, I couldn't do it in Gaza. And then when I had the, uh, the fellowship program at Harvard University, I had the uh, the the very, the very good uh, health insurance. And I went to the doctors and they had, they, they did everything necessary to diagnose my, my, my ear problem. And then we booked the, uh, the surgery date. And then it had to be postponed because of COVID. That was in April. So I had the surgery in July, uh, 2020. So about a year from today. So I first wrote the, I, I wrote the first half of the poem and I showed it to my doctor after, just a month after the surgery. And she felt very happy about it. So I'm dedicating it to, to her. And then a few days later, I thought of writing an, uh, the other half of the poem. And you will, you will understand what I mean about first half and second half. So things you may find hidden in my ear. For Alicia Kusnell, MD. One, when you open my ear, touch it gently. My mother's voice lingers somewhere inside. Her voice is the echo that helps recover my equilibrium when I feel dizzy during my attentiveness. You may encounter songs in Arabic, poems in English I recite to myself, or a song I chant to the chirping birds in our backyard. When you stitch the cut, don't forget to, pull all, to put all these back in my ear. Put them back in order as you would do with books on your shelf. Two, the drone's buzzing sound, the roar of an F-16, the screams of bombs falling on houses, on fields, on bodies, of rockets flying away, rid my small ear, ear canal of them all. Spray the perfume of your smiles on the incision. Inject the song of life into my veins to wake me up. Gently beat the drum so my mind may dance with yours, my doctor, day and night. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Musab. And shall we open it up for Q&A? Yes, please. Uh... Feel free to uh, put any questions you might want to put in writing in the chat and raise a hand if you would like to uh, pose a question orally. Uh, please don't hesitate. 
And thank you so much to Mossab and uh, to Refka for this wonderful conversation to start us off today. Uh, very inspiring. <laughs> And I just might mention also uh, to highlight this because we have just heard from the forthcoming album uh, in English, uh, uh, Things You May Find Hidden in My Ear. This uh, collection of poetry will be published next spring by City Lights Books in San Francisco. So we very much look forward to seeing that. I might pose a question to begin, um, if that's all right. And Mosab, I was quite intrigued uh, by, if I heard you correctly, when you were uh, addressing the beginnings of your writing poetry, uh, um, speaking about you found that the more that you wrote, the more you found yourself. And if I heard you correctly, I heard I didn't know I was writing poetry. Uh, and I was very intrigued by that statement and uh, would love to hear more about how this genre, uh, how this form came to you and, uh, and perhaps imposed itself or how you were drawn to it. Uh, it, it was just fascinating to hear yeah. that. But I mean, this is a very, a very important question because in Arabic, the tradition is different when it comes to poetry from English. So, I mean, Arabic is just sometimes it's it's very rigid when it comes to the form of the poem. So not anything you write would be called a poem. So even, even the poems that I write in Arabic, many people say, okay, this is not poetry. Where is the, the rhyme? Where is the meter? Where is this or that? So because English, uh, po poetry in English is more, more modern, if I would say, or more open to the modern approach to writing poetry, uh, when I started writing a line or two lines, see, people would say, I like this po poem, the, this beautiful poem. This is poetic. This is this and that. So, and also when I studied at university, I mean, all we studied were uh, classical poems, Shakespeare, Milton, uh, Bernard Shaw, sorry, uh, Edgar Allan Poe, and those uh, uh, classical poets. Uh, so, when I found myself writing things which people receive, I mean, I don't even care about whether what I'm writing is poetry or not. I just want to write something that, that touches people's hearts and minds. I want to leave an impression on people, tell them that we do have the capacity to write and we, ha we do have feelings and we can deliver them by way of poetry or in prose. So, and, if I, and this is also funny to add that even when I was creating the Edward Said Public Library, I mean, before, before I chose the name, I was collecting books. I mean, at the beginning, I, I wasn't having that idea of a, a library and there would be shelves, chairs, tables, people coming, a librarian and open, open, opening hours, etc. So <laughs> this is funny to say, but when I was creating the library, I didn't know that I was creating it. That's wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much for those comments. And I see yeah. that we have a hand, uh, Natalie. Yeah. Hello, Masab. Hello, everybody. I have a question for Masab. Knowing that you are uh, now a diasporic artist and a transnational artist, and you've lived and worked in Puzza, and you've lived and worked in the United States, how this transnational element to your life and your experience has changed your writing. And I'm also wondering if you could speak to what you hope American audiences or audiences outside of Palestine most get from your poetry. What is the message you would most like them to hear from you? Yeah, I mean, having having left Gaza, thank you, Natalie, first. Having left Gaza for the first time in, in 2019, I mean, crossing the boundary of Gaza, boarding the plane for the first time, seeing people who I used to see on Facebook and meeting some public figures like Noam Chomsky uh, in Arizona. Um, so, I mean, this, so, so before I left Gaza, if you ask me, uh, how big is the world? I would say maybe six times, 10 times bigger than Gaza. <laughs> I mean, this, I mean, the siege and the occupation has limited our capacity to think of a planet that big. So when I left Gaza, I mean, 
I started to see the earth as it is. When I traveled from, let's say Syracuse to New York City, we, uh, we spent about seven hours in the car. I mean, I said, oh, we are still moving from a state to a state, not from the East Coast to the, uh, to the, to the West Coast. How big this country is. And now we are living. So I'm not sure if this is adding to the answer. And now, so I, I, was start, I was addressing myself. And now we are in Gaza living in this 141 uh, square miles. People are coming from Russia, from Europe to this spot on earth. And they are leaving all these, all these countries, all this space. And when we Gazans want to leave Gaza, for a fellowship at Harvard, in my case, or for Yale or Oxford for a, a scholarship for other students. And they, when they want to leave Gaza, this very small place, this small prison, <clears throat> they are faced with difficulties. They are not giving the visas when they want it. Why is all this happening to us? Um, so this has affected me. I mean, I mean, my mind has widened up. I could see more nature. I could see squirrels for the first time years I could see the train so I wrote I wrote a poem about uh, a train in in Arabic um, and I wrote about I, I wrote a poem about an airplane in Arabic where a child asks his mother so I mean without leaving Gaza and boarding a plane I wouldn't think of, of this image uh, I wrote that uh, the the plane was violating the privacy of the clouds because it's above them the <laughs> The, the plane was violating the privacy, the privacy of the clouds. And a child looks outside the window, through the window, and asks his mother, why doesn't it rain when we are above the plane? Why doesn't it rain on us when we are above the plane, the clouds, sorry. So, I mean, this, this experience has, has given me uh, lots of things. It added to my thinking. Uh, I, I think I'm now a global citizen. Uh, I think now I'm, uh, I'm living another life. But when I came back to Gaza in, uh, in February this year, just three years before the May attack, this, all these things never helped me because now I'm living again in Gaza. And even on my way back to Gaza from uh, America, uh, on my way through Egypt to Gaza, uh, the many security checks, the many searchings. I returned to be a Gazan. I was not, I was not treated as someone who was in America or who was a fellow at Harvard or who is a poet. No, no. I was, I was just treated as something, not a Gazan. No, something. Which, which makes me sad to say. Yes. Thank you so much for that response and that wonderful question, Natalie. Um, Hannah has a hand raised as well. Hi, Masab and Rivka. Thank you so much for this amazing conversation. Um, it's really good to see you both. Um, I wanted to ask you, Masab, um, if you could talk a little bit about the life of poets and writers and intellectuals in Gaza. Um, in terms of like what the conditions are, are there is there access to the books, <laughs> uh, the spaces, the you know the time and and kind of safe spaces that you need to write and generate ideas, um, and um, also like whether or not most of the conversations that you're having are happening online or like on the ground in Gaza or a combination, um, and maybe you can talk a little bit about your library too because it sounds incredible. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is a very good question to talk about not myself only, but also about my colleagues and those writers who might not uh, had might not have had the opportunity maybe to leave Gaza or to write in English to be read in this uh, this important language. So unfortunately, because of the political rift uh, between Gaza and the West Bank, between the two main factions, uh, Hamas and Fatah, uh, writers in Gaza are not supported. Um, uh, we don't have publishing houses in Gaza. So I mean, uh, when 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 if if I want to to publish my book, uh, sometimes I would have to pay money uh, uh, to have it printed. 
and I would get some copies back. Uh, if I if I print my book outside Gaza, then you will be on a journey of waiting for months until you get your copies because of the siege. So a writer cannot publish his book in Gaza easily. And he, if he publishes it outside Gaza, he would wait for months until he gets his copies. Even the books that are printed in the West Bank, which is about a, a few kilometers away from Gaza. So there is a, the, the air is crossing, border crossing between Gaza and the West Bank, and it's controlled by the Israelis. So let me, let me just give you an example. A friend of mine from Jordan, uh, he is a Palestinian Jordanian writer. He wanted, he sent me, and I have his book with me in Arabic. This is his book. It's, it's printed in, in Jordan. His name is Taysir Abu Oda. Okay, so he printed, he, he got it printed in Jordan and he wanted to send it to me via DHL to Gaza. So let's, let's, let's start our journey now. So he sent it from Amman, Jordan. I tracked the shipment. The book went to Dubai and Emirates, United Arab Emirates, and from Dubai to Frankfurt in Germany, and from Frankfurt to Tel Aviv, and from Tel Aviv to Gaza. So it took, <laughs> so it took, so the book, the book could travel to Dubai, to Frankfurt, to Tel Aviv and to Gaza. And it was in, 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 in Jordan. So five places for about 200 pages. But the palace, so as if the Israelis are telling us, you see, paper can travel, but you cannot. We are so sorry. <laughs> so this is, this is from Jordan to Gaza. And they took the journey of, leave, of traveling to three foreign countries. Um, uh, a friend of mine sent, Sent, sent me some books uh, on September 27th, so about 40 days from today. The shipment still hasn't made it to Gaza. It has been in Israel since September, uh, sorry, she sent it on August 27th. The, the box, the parcel, made it to Tel Aviv uh, on September 6th, so a month from today. The, the shipment is still there. I don't know what it's doing. Uh, maybe it's, uh, it <laughs> I don't want to be <laughs> funny. Maybe it's reading something. It's, uh, it's going to Yaffa, visiting Yaffa uh, on my behalf. I don't know. Um, so this is the life of a writer, our life of a reader. Um, in Gaza, I, as I mentioned, there is no support for writers or readers. And what I'm trying to do with, with the Edward Said Public Library is offering a venue to the readers and writers to meet and to read and to hold events. Um, and I think you mentioned something about uh, online events. Unfortunately, I think I'm lucky to, uh, to not have been cut by the poor internet connection that I have. I mean, internet connection is unreliable in Gaza. Electricity is not reliable. So electricity is off in my area and the, the lamps, the light that you see here is powered by a battery. So without having the battery, you wouldn't see me. You would just hear my voice. <laughs> uh, so this is the life of a writer and, um, and a reader in Gaza. It's, it's not easy. It's not easy. And even for a journal, I mean, if, if I subscribe to a, to a journal or a magazine outside, maybe if I sub subscribe to, to, the, to the Times magazine or the New York Times, if I order it today, I would <laughs> receive it uh, two months later and I would read about the past, which is something good to live. Thank you so much. Is your internet powered by battery as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's, if it's empty, if there's no battery, then uh, you would talk to, to a black screen. Wow. Uh -huh. for everything you do.
I see two <laughs> additional uh, hands that have uh, been raised. There have been two questions waiting in the chat. I may address those uh, quickly okay. first, if that's okay, Azarine and uh, Amil. Uh, I see that Arman has posed a question about language. Um, you talked about writing in both Arabic and English, Arabic being your native tongue and English being the language of the empire, the colonizer. I am curious to know how Hebrew fits into your work and your consciousness, if it does at all, as the language of the occupier. Um, okay, so Hebrew is the language uh, that people speak in Israel. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, I have no problem writing in Hebrew if I, if I master the language. So Hebrew is not taught in Gaza, only Arabic and English, English Arabic as the native tongue, and English as a foreign language that is taught from the first grade until high school, and you can major in it at university. So I, I never had the chance of learning Hebrew. And if I had the, the capacity to write in Hebrew, I would write it because it would be very good for people in Israel <clears throat> to hear about what I'm writing about because they don't usually hear what, what happens in Gaza except from the Israeli media. And I think uh, just a few, a few weeks ago, a friend of mine who lives in Israel, uh, she's American, but she goes back and forth to Israel. Uh, she asked me to translate some, some of my poems uh, and send them for publication uh, in Israel. She translated them into Hebrew and they are published in a magazine or I think a website. So I have no problem in being, uh, in being translated into Hebrew or of, of, being, uh, of writing uh, in Hebrew. I think it, it would be good uh, poetry is a means of uh, communication between nations, just as language is. Mm -hmm. And maybe uh, this follows because it's a question from Maria Rosa regarding poetry, uh, precisely. Um, you want to tell a story of survival, but you choose poetry and not narrative. What do you think the impact of poetry is for you? Yeah. <clears throat> I think poetry is is deeper. Uh, when I, when I write poetry, it's I, I go into deep feelings, while when I write in uh, in prose, it's about conversation and sometimes adding adding more and more details, but still the same idea. But when I write in poetry, I want to read small things which carry an image that you would spend an hour or two hours with. So I, it's a true, I write, I write prose, I write stories, uh, but I focus on writing poetry. And again, I'm not sure I'm a writer, I'm not a scientist or I'm not a scholar. I don't usually decide whether I want to write this in poetry or in fiction in prose. I just write, however it comes out, it's there. And I, I sometimes try to think, maybe the words I'm writing are on the piece of paper, on the sheet of paper. And when I put my pen, they start to, to appear on the paper. They are, they are already there. When I hold the pen, they start to, to appear on the paper. Or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe the words and the images are in the pen and they know their way, whether to end this line here or to start a line with a small letter or a capital letter. I just write. And I usually don't revise what I write until maybe months later. Thank you so much. Azarine has a hand raised. Thank you, Alison. I'll let Emil ask his question first. And then if there's time, I'll jump in. Thanks, Azarin. Thank you, uh, Rivka and Mossad. That was fantastic uh, to hear the discussion and beautifully expressive reading. I just wanted to follow up with what Hannah said. Uh, sometime over the last year, Mossad and I had conceived of a project of uh, a magazine of work coming from Gaza in English. And so I got a group together of translators and we just did a few poems by a poet. And now the magazine is about to come out 
and this is the problem of mail, you know, like I want to get it, <laughs> I want to get it to Nasser Rabah and to Mossab and, you know, it could take two, three, four months and it might never get there. So it's really a problem. You know, it's, it's a huge problem. Just, um, yeah. So I just wanted to add that to the, to the uh, mix. Yeah. Thank you, Emil. I mean, Emil's work is, is really invaluable. Uh, to the help of people, poet, poets in Gaza. Uh, has, he has been very uh, supportive of my work. I would like to thank him. And I would like to thank uh, Elaine, uh, the editor at City Lights Books. And I would like to thank every, every person in this Zoom room uh, for this wonderful opportunity to speak. Thank you. Go ahead, Azarin, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mossab and, and Rafka for just, uh, yeah, letting us share in this conversation. And I, I think we're out of time for me to ask a, a question, but I just wanted to just say how much I appreciate just your poetry and the work that you're doing building the library, especially because I, I you know, I think that another layer of the exile is that kind of temporal jet lag where, um, you know, everything arrives with this tremendous delay um, and access to knowledge and information is, is withheld and the ability to communicate is interrupted. Um, and I feel like novels are time capsules that allow us to, to travel in our minds when when that's the only form of mobility that we can have. So, um, yeah, I guess I, I'm going to ask a question that you feel free feel free to just reject completely. But if there's a way that um, the library can be supported in any way, um, just don't hesitate to let us know. Um, and then if City Lights, there's a link for us to include here in the chat so that we can pre-order Mossab's book. That would be great to have as well. Um, and then just a reminder, um, Allison, if you or I, whatever you prefer, just to announce upcoming events. But I, I really, really cherish the conversation. Thank you both so much. Yes, thank you. I, I don't know if Refka, you wanted to say a final word. You have led such a, a rich conversation with Mossab and uh, uh, if you want to say yeah. anything. I just wanted to thank Mushab so much for this opportunity to engage with his poetry. And I really enjoyed this conversation, all the preparation and discussions we had before. And it's uh, without this kind of event, actually, we would never have met, I think, um, because of this disconnect and isolation of Gaza and the difficulties in not just physically reaching that, but even uh, just connecting in general. And I think... Uh, I'm really grateful for this opportunity. So thank you to the organizers. Thank you to Mushab for sharing his poetry insights and stories and, and, and kind of deep reflections on this condition of being somebody who was born in Gaza, but pining for a Palestine, pining for Yaffa, and Yaffa appears so much in your poetry. So I hope that you will one day uh, connect with your Yaffa. Mm -hmm. Many thanks. I'm yeah. I'm very thankful uh, to Notre Dame uh, University, to the University of Notre Dame, and to City Lights, uh, to everyone present here. And I would like to say that uh, because I love Yaffa and I never went there, I named my my daughter Yaffa. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you to both of you. And uh, on behalf of a member of this uh, inspiring group and uh, um, a wonderful, you know, uh, just a uh, participant who, who admires all that's going on in literatures of annihilation, exile, and uh, resistance, I can't imagine a better uh, uh, a session today uh, for this series. And I will just let Azarine say a few words about what is coming up uh, in this ongoing series of, of events. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Um, yeah, so we have next month, we have two events coming up, which is unusual for us. One had to get rescheduled, but we couldn't be more thrilled. Amiel Alkali, who's here with us today, will be joining uh, Sonala uh, Ibrahim from Egypt. 
And I believe it's gonna be maybe one of the only or the first conversations Sonala will be having um, in the American kind of landscape, although we keep things virtual because of our, um, because of our communication with, you know, the diaspora and our homeland audiences. Um, this series would not really work without your presence, um, but we're excited to have Sonala join us. Next month, we also have an event with, um, American poet Dwayne Betts and um, American scholar James Ford III. Um, and that will be, uh, both of those will be happening next month. And in December, uh, we're really looking forward to hosting Roger Reeves, uh, uh, Sonwaz Sharif, um, and a few other writers as well. So you can at, join our listserv on our Literatures of Annihilation, Exile, and Resistance website. Uh, so you can stay stay informed and RSVP. You do not need an institutional affiliation. You all know you all know this because you're here. You can put whatever, but if you're spreading the word, please make sure you let people know. Um, they can just put not applicable. It's uh, we don't want that to be a barrier. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. And please pre-order Mossab's book. Uh, Pre-orders make a huge difference. Thank you, everyone. Excellent. Thank you, everyone.